So on to the real meat of it. Um, thanks for catching the sound early, <laughs> sound issues for some of you. Um, the, the reason that scintillators are such an interesting detector right now is, is uh, multifaceted. Really though, the, the crux of it is the water equivalence for megavoltage photons and electrons. So as we're trying to meet this challenge of small field dosimetry, trying to get down to fields that really are comparable in size to the detectors that we're using, um, then the composition of the detector really comes into play so much more than it does with those larger fields. So not perturbing the beam right there at the point of measurement becomes a huge advantage. Um, the ability to make these detectors small so that we can push that envelope so we can get down into those really, really small fields is also an advantage of simulators. Um, for these megavoltage photons and electrons, we're not seeing dose or dose rate dependencies, which also aids in simplifying the measurements that you're making um, so that you don't have to correct for or watch out for some of those changes as the the um, the the dose rates are increasing. We're looking at at, um, at uh, very high doses in a short amount of time. Um, that's a, also an interesting um, avenue that, to pursue with some of this. The energy independence um, and the beam quality correction factor of unity really reflect back to that water equivalence for these beams. Um, that you, uh, That's kind of the proof in the pudding that, that it's really not changing those interactions um, there at the point of measurement based on what would have been uh, happening just in water. There is a small temperature dependence that has been seen um, if, you're, if you're doing um, a large range of temperatures, it's about a tenth of a percent per degree. As long as you're at room temperature or near room temperature just doing QA measurements, um, it really doesn't affect your data, so you don't have to correct for that. The other advantage of scintillators is that there aren't any ferromagnetic materials within the detector itself. Um, so we make a long fiber, you can use it with an MR Linux, um, as long as the electronics themselves um, stay outside the five gauss line. So what are scintillators really? Um, it's an organic scintillating material, um, depending on which detector you have, it's a one millimeter diameter, three millimeter long, or one millimeter diameter, one millimeter long active scintillating region. Um, that scintillating material, or organic material, is coupled to an optical transfer fiber um, that is PMMA. So again, water equivalent at these energies, at least um, close enough that, that it's not affecting your measurements. Um, it really is the scintillator itself that, um, that matters, and it's water equivalent as well. The difficulty with scintillators is that you do produce Cherenkov light in that optical transfer fiber. So this manifests really as a stem effect. It's a different amount of additional optical signal based on the amount of stem that's in the field, the amount of that transfer fiber. Um, so we use a two-channel chromatic correction method to get rid of the Cherenkov or to remove it from the, the measurement channel. And that's based on a publication by Matthew Guyot et al. from MedPhysics. Um, a little over 10 years ago. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind about scintillators is that they're not um, what the, the National Standards Lab would call a, a, um, a reference dosimeter, or excuse me, a, um, an absolute dosimeter. That's the word I'm looking for. You have to cross calibrate it with something else in order to get output in terms of dose. And part of the reason for this is, is that we can't, we can't calculate dose from first principles. You, you, have to, um, you, you do have to compare it with something that gives you a known dose, um, partly because the, the plastic um, degrades with dose. Um, it also discolors with dose. The optical transfer fiber turns yellow. Um, and so your signal decreases as your fiber um, receives higher and higher doses throughout its lifetime. So you do need to recalibrate it periodically as it accumulates dose as well. We get about a 2% decrease in signal for every thousand gray that it receives. Um, this two-channel chromatic correction, the, I actually know it, I, I say it here. The two-channel chromatic correction that we use really splits that optical signal into two sections of the spectrum. We call one the blue region and one the green. Um, and the blue region is primarily your scintillation signal, um, along with some contaminant Cherenkov. The green is primarily Cherenkov, although a little bit of the scintillation signal bleeds over into that as well. 
Um, so the characterization measurements that we have you do um, really are designed to keep the dose to the scintillator constant and change the amount of optical fiber that's in the field. So once you, once you position it in the field, um, you would do um, what we call a minimum fiber measurement where you have as little fiber as possible in that, that field that you're using for characterization and then um, wrap the fiber around in one of the jigs that we have. The, the blue here is the water tank jig for the W2. The larger slabs for the W1 um, have channels milled out. Uh, but the idea really is that that, that change in Cherenkov change, changes only this broad spectrum Cherenkov um, uh, signal. It doesn't change the, the scintillation signal that we're measuring. So we can look at the difference in the blue channel signal compared with the difference in the green channel signal for those two configurations and create what's called a Cherenkov light ratio. And this really is just a, a correction factor that's applied to subsequent measurements in order to remove the Cherenkov from the blue signal based on the amount of signal in the green channel. If you want to do a dose calibration and cross calibrate with, an, with a known dose, um, rather than just doing relative measurements, say, for output factors, you can give it a known dose with a reference field size. The 10 by 10, for instance, is marked out on the um, positioning slabs that come with the W1. And that really just becomes a scaling factor unit conversion that, that's applied to this calculation. So instead of um, nanocoulombs or picocoulombs that have been collected, um, it's, it turns into uh, centigrade based on, on your characterization, your calibration of the, the device. So the W1 was our first generation device. It's been available for about eight years now. It has only that one millimeter by three millimeter active area as an option. Um, the fiber is coupled directly to the optics. So that's all one piece really for the detect that detector. Um, there are a number of publications, a lot of publications available about the W1, comparing it with other detectors at the beginning, um, and then later publications, so it's kind of fun to watch the transition. It became the detector that everyone was comparing to in order to see what their, their ion chambers or diodes um, were doing at these small fields. So one of the key publications then is the joint publication from the AAPM and the IAEA um, published as uh, TRS-483 which lists um, tables of correction factors for a number of different uh, detectors for small fields for different energies, um, looking at the correction factors that are required as your beam energy changes and spectrum changes um, as that collimation gets uh, very small. So the, the fun part about the W1 here is that in every table that it shows up in, every correction factor that's listed for it is unity. And it is the only detector within this publication that can claim that. Limitations of the W1 really are that it, it is a single point measurement system. It was designed for output factor measurements initially. Um, it also does require a two channel electrometer in order to perform that Cherenkov subtraction calculation. So we have the routine built into our Supermax. Um, it will walk you through the characterization as well as the dose calibration, and then it will um, up, apply that correction and do the calculation for you for your later measurements. If you were to try and use someone else's two channel electrometer, you'll have to do the math yourself, but uh, it is of course possible. Um, I would caution you to be aware of the low signal limitations of your electrometer. Um, it does require a very high sensitivity and high accuracy for these low currents that you're getting from the light from the simulator. The second generation device is called the W2, um, and this one actually has uh, multiple fibers you can use with a dedicated optics and electronics system called the Max SD. Um, so we, we provide the system with both a one by one millimeter um, scintillator and a one by three. And the rationale for including both of these really is that for your extremely small fields, everyone wants the one by one because it's a uniform size. You don't have to worry about volume averaging over the three millimeter length of the fiber. Um, you can use it in whichever orientation and not have to worry about what that cross section looks like in your beam. Um, so the volume averaging becomes a lot easier to figure out. The one by three, however, gives you a direct connection to or, or correlation with all of the W1 publications that came before because the fiber is identical. 
Um, it's the same geometry, same size, same everything. <laughs> um, and so you can compare with what has been done before. It also gives you three times the signal. So if you were trying to scan, for instance, in um, slightly larger small fields where you may not need that one millimeter length uh, resolution on the scintillator, um, it gives you um, three times the signal to noise. So it, it's a little bit nicer that way for some of the slightly larger fields. The Max SD, which is shown here, has uh, optical input. So the, the optical fiber plugs directly into that. It, it takes the optical signal, converts it to an electronic signal, um, it will um, allow you to do the um, Cherenkov correction with this device. Um, it will um, also allow you to do point measurements directly with this device, no additional electrometer needed. Um, but it can also take that input signal um, for every 10 millisecond integration. It can apply the Cherenkov correction and then convert that corrected signal back into an analog output so that the current is sent to your water tank electrometer so that you can scan with it with your standard water tank scanning software. Um, so the way this works is that we have an, an adapter sleeve for the W2 so you can mount it in any standard um, ion chamber water scanner. Um, so it'll, it'll um, match if either a seven millimeter diameter or, or eight millimeter diameter um, standard chamber holder for anybody's water tank. Um, that uh, optical fiber then is, um, is connected to the Max SD, and the Max SD has a triaxial output that goes that would then be connected to the input of your water tank scanning electrometer. Um, from the perspective of the electro of the water tank scanning system, this detector looks and functions like a diode. You don't apply bias to it. Um, but when the detector is irradiated, a current is generated and that's uh, received by this uh, water tank electrometer. We do apply a gain factor to the output so that this signal um, goes from a very small electronic signal um, from that, the, the optical signal um, to a, a signal more in line with what your water tank electrometer is designed to handle. We, I mentioned this in a previous slide, but we do provide a jig um, that can be used for the CLR measurements in the water tank as well. This is looking down at the water tank um, to, to show both the minimum fiber and maximum fiber configurations. Um, you can also use a rectangular field method with it set up in the scanning position. Um, and that's described in the user manual if you were to want to get into that detail. Some example from um, actually a few years ago now when the W2 was first, um, first launched. This is a publication from Paulina Galavis and the group at NYU Langone um, looking at comparing the W2 with the W1 um, both for um, just physical characteristics and behavior of the fiber. As expected, none of the behaviors changed. The dose and dose rate dependencies were um, as expected. Um, but they also compared the scanning measurements um, of small fields with film. And so this is just a comparison of a one centimeter field scanned with a W2 compared with the, the measurement with gaffermic film. And they, of course, as you see, they got excellent agreement. Um, another publication, um, I should I should dig out some more recent ones, but from, from about three years ago from Richard Popple's group, at uh, University, of, University of Alabama at Birmingham was looking at patient target measurements to see how small a target they could measure accurately um, with the W2, comparing it with film. Um, and they looked at targets down to a three millimeter diameter um, target and got excellent agreement between the film again and the W2, and actually a, a lower variation between measurements, uh, lower uncertainty on the measurement with the W2 compared to the, uh, with the film. As anybody who's used film for small fields knows, it's, it's a tricky business as well. Um, the images that are shown here show, um, also kind of indicate water equivalents that you can't see where the W2 scintillator is within this chamber plug. Um, so we do provide a, a BB marker fiber, a dummy fiber, so that you can localize it uh, with your imaging system. Make sure you're aligned properly before you treat your phantom plan um, or, or do your small field measurements. Um, but also, if you were to do an end-to-end -end test with it with the Lucy phantom or the STVP phantom or something like that, um, you can see where you need to plan to. 
Um, so that's what I had for you today. Please, if you do have questions, put them in the chat now or follow up with us um, via the website um, or your sales representative. I do appreciate your attention today. I know uh, there are a lot of different um, different places calling for your attention. Um, it's uh, it's lovely that you're you're spending a little time with us to learn about this excite these exciting detectors. So a question about the output factor measurements. Um, is it best to center the W2 for its, the, to the maximum reading? Yes, it is. Um, that's, that's definitely the best thing to do. I will caution you, though, that um, you need to make sure that your CLR is appropriate. Um, if, you, if you're measuring output factors for a 15 by 15 field, but you did your CLR with a 2 by 10, um, then you may not accurately be representing the, the Cherenkov correction. Um, you need to make sure that, that you've covered the range really of the, the maximum amount of fiber that you might have in the field for some of these small field, uh, medium field measurements. The small ones are easier to target. Um, and then how to make sure that it's at the center of the field. Um, really, I would say if you're, it's easy in the water tank um, because you can scan back and forth to find the center. Um, if you're measuring in a slab phantom, say on the, the couch, um, really aligning to that BB is the best because that that ought, that should be aligned with the center of the um, the detector if you have the, the marker fiber compared with the, the active fiber. Um, if you, I don't know very many people who have a, a good stepping stage um, to step it in and out. Um, oh, that's right. Yes, the, the question was related to the Meridian system to try and, and align it in the MR field. Um, that's an excellent question. I don't have a good imaging um, solution for you for ensuring you're at the center of the field. Um, it may, that may be something that we need to talk about offline um, to try and help you figure out the best solution for aligning, um, for, for double checking centering in the MR environment. Um, but stepping it back and forth in and out um, of the field slightly in order to make sure that you're centered is usually a good idea when you're when you're looking at the very small fields. Um, obviously, a slight offset um, can drastically affect your results. The question of do you have to calibrate the CLR coefficient as a function of the field sizes? Um, you do not actually. You um, there are three different methods that we recommend that you could choose from for measuring CLR. Um, the larger field method uses a 30 by 30 field um, and the, the solid slabs from the W1, um, which are an option. You can get them with the W2 as well. Um, that may not be quite as accurate when you get down to the extremely small fields. Um, and the reason for that is just some differential irradiation of the, the PMMA fiber. Um, the, you, when you're mostly measuring very small fields, you may ca cause that discoloration right at the tip of the PMMA fiber before it meets the, uh, the scintillator. Um, and if that's the only portion of the fiber that you're creating Cherenkov in, that Cherenkov spectrum might be slightly different. So the balance between the blue and the green channels may be slightly different if you're using that larger field characterization method and a really small field that you're measuring output factors for. Um, so you can also do the CLR measurement in something like a 10 by 10 field or the six centimeter cone from a cyber knife um, using that water tank jig, the blue water tank jig that I showed. Um, that's excellent as long as you're you're not going much above a 10 by 10. Uh, again, for that same reason of, of the differential in how, um, how much dose your fiber has at different portions along it. Um, a lot of people prefer the rectangular field method um, where you would use something like a 2 by 20 field in, and rotate the collimator in between. So the dose is the same to the simulator, but you're, you're, and, uh, you're changing the dose to the, the optical fiber that way. Um, but no, you don't have to do a different CLR for each different field size you're trying to measure. Once you, once you have an appropriate CLR, um, then you can measure a, a broad range of field sizes. 
Um, there's a question about whether the um, the detector is designed only for field output factors or if it can be used for measuring beam profiles. The W2 can absolutely be met, used for measuring beam profiles. That's That was the whole rationale for having the output um, that can go to the scanning tank. Um, within your um, MR environment, I don't know what tank you're using, if it's um, if it is a, a manual positioning tank or if it's automatic positioning, but whichever tank that you're using, um, you can certainly use the W2 as the detector within that tank. Good questions. I will comment um, in relation to the MR Linux again. Um, there, because of the um, the curving of the electron path due to the magnetic field, um, it is fairly important that you keep the orientation of the fiber the same uh, between your um, characterization and your measurements. Um, just because of the the, the way Cherenkov is produced, it has a preferential angle of 45 degrees to um, the from the direction of, of travel of the electrons. And since we're relying on total internal reflection down that PMMA fiber, um, the orientation of the fiber within the magnetic field can change a little bit um, just what spectrum of the Cherenkov light is collected. And again, it's that balance between the blue and the green that matters, not the magnitude of the Cherenkov. Um, and so that, that may change slightly in between um, one angle versus another within the MR field. Um, in a standard LINAC, it's not so critical if you're, if you're located in the X plane or the Y plane, uh, for instance, um, just because you don't have that additional complicating factor. 